Can you tell us uh, just a few of the people in your illustrious career that you played with or recorded with? Well, I can start with the, the, the musicians from Detroit, you know, because they, they nurtured me. Uh -huh. um, they mentored me and they inspired me. And I could start with people like Sam Sanders, who was, who, who was my saxophone teacher at the time. But there was yeah. people like Beans Bowles, Charles Moore, and you know, all these, you know, and there's Wendell Harrison, um, Hakeem Jami, Marcus Belgrave, of course. You know, these were guys that, that saw enough of me to want to impart their knowledge and their patience. I should say that patience with a young musician who was aspiring to be like they were. Ed Nuccelli hired me. He had the house band at the uh, Elmwood Casino. Legendary Elmwood Casino, yeah. Legendary Elmwood Casino. And he hired me to play in the house band there. Charles Bowles was a member of the house band and Danny Spencer and Ed Pickens. And they would bring people like, we got a chance to work with uh, Ella Fitzgerald for two weeks, uh, Lena Horn for two weeks. And they would always bring in great, great musicians to accompany them. Ella Fitzgerald had Tommy Flanagan at Detroit. Wow. You know, and uh, Freddie Waits before he had, he had passed. Lena Horn had Gabor Zabo playing guitar with her, which was Ooh. really, you know, for my young, I guess I was 20, 21, it, it was mesmerizing. Give us a little snapshot of what you did after you left Detroit. So uh, I went on and moved to Boston because I wanted to immerse myself. I was taking classes at New England Conservatory, playing around. I stayed in Boston for a year came back to Detroit, and then I moved to Los Angeles in 1975. My motive was to make money playing <laughs> in the studios because there were a lot of Detroit musicians that had moved to, Detroit, to Los Angeles at that time. I kind of got into the uh, studio scene doing sessions, but my thing has always been to be a performer. Later on, I, I, I went on the road with uh, Norman Connors and my friend Billy McCoy, who, uh, who is also from Detroit. And uh, I played with Farrell Sanders. Uh, he had, you know, we did the Montreux Festival. We did a lot of things. Norman had some hit records at that time. So I did get a chance to make Los Angeles a, a home. While I was in Los Angeles, I went back and got my BA in ethnomusicology because of the group, the musical group that we were involved with, Eternal Wind, which was Charles Moore, Adam Rudolph, Federico Ramos, we uh, were all not only performers, but we were also deep researchers into the music and study. Uh, I was the first person at UCLA that they awarded a BA in ethnomusicology. And I came out, you know, and I started teaching at, you know, all levels. I went back to UCLA uh, after 20 years, and I got my master's in African-American studies. Do you think people understand and appreciate the contributions that the city has made to the music and Black arts culture in, in general? You know, Marty, there are people still in Detroit that are very, very aware of the cultural identity of Detroit and the de great musicians that came out. The Detroit musicians, the level of, of musicians that was always in Detroit, and these musicians did not just come from, from CT or Cass Tech. The, every public school, every public school had outstanding music, music departments. Um, we did a tribute to Ken Cox a couple years ago at the Detroit Jazz Festival. And it was a big band, and I was the musical director for this. Everybody on that bandstand was a product of Detroit public schools. Racy Biggs, George Bohannon, Issa Abram Alim, who I've known since I was a, a, a teenager uh, playing percussion. Everybody on that bandstand, and it must have been 15 to 20 musicians, was a product of Detroit public schools.
Yeah. It was historical. 